friends, colleagues, travelers together. Welcome to this CWME Dear 21, the third session and the last session for this day. As we gather on the theme, Rise to Life, Doing Theology in Public Places or Spaces. So I'm Michael Jagasar, for those whom I have not introduced myself to as yet, one of CWM's mission secretary. And on behalf of the general secretary of the Council for Our Mission, the Reverend Dr. Yusuf Kuhn, we are delighted that you can join us and that you can continue to be with us across multiple time zones. We are delighted and so we welcome you. Please note as we are obligated and it's necessary to say that this webinar is being recorded and with the intention for it to be edited and to make it available at a later date. And as we welcome all of you at this webinar, we are going to pose a couple of poll questions on your screen. Please take a, at most 30 seconds to answer these. We would also like to encourage colleagues, our listeners and those who are attending, as well as the panelists, to use the question and answer feature or the Facebook comment section if you're joining via Facebook to submit your questions for each other for, and for the panelists. So questions as well as comments. It is my task to introduce our panelists for this final session for today. You'll find their fuller biographies, the biographies of the members of the panel at the EDA webpage, which will be placed in the Zoom chat and the Facebook comment section, including a link where you can read more and learn more about members of the panel, their location, their work, their commitments, some of their publications or the things they're interested in. The panelists will be spotlighted as we mention them. Unfortunately, we won't be joined by Anna Jane Lange reading her poem. She's located in Fiji, but we do have a copy of her program, so I'll read it. And her poem is titled, What I See, Hear, and Understand. And this will be followed by three presentations. The first from the EDA team. So you have Sai, Sioni, and Peachy will be making a presentation on the theme and trying to locate the theme on a biblical text and perhaps a biblical character. This would be followed by Graham Adams, who would also be doing a presentation and the title of his presentation and his biography would be posted in a short while. And joining us also would be theologian and artist, Neil Thorogood, who will be reflecting on a piece of art that he has created around the theme. And after the presentations, Beverly Haddad, who is our listener, will offer a short response to the poem and presentations aimed at getting us started in our discussion or into our discussion. So the presenters for this session, session three on day one, will be looking at death and disabilities. You know, they're painful and limiting for the persons involved as well as for their partners and companions. We do not deny those realities and the discriminations that they draw from people in churches and the wider society. But could death and disabilities also be opportunities to inform the way we think theologically and the way that we live? This, we think, is a critical question that this panel is going to explore. So unless Anna is here with us, I would then read our Call to Rise poem by Anna Jane Lange. What I see, hear, and understand. They said I do not listen. In one ear and out the other. That I disregard their advice and disrespect our culture. 
simply because I refuse to stretch my soul into a canvas. They can paint on their instructions and deliver to the masses. They said, I do not see or understand the bigger picture, but all I see is inhibition of what could be a better future. I also want to bear our flag and parade it in the light, but we need to invest in what will also glow at night. We need to see that a child is a gift and not an item that we decorate our shells with, but needing heart and soul investment. We need to help our brothers buckling underneath the pressure of a role they were assigned, but never properly prepared for. We need to help our sisters selling skin for recognition that carries only until sunrise, breaking their dreams into pieces. We need to see that disability need not a segregated community, but rather seeing a new window to understanding our humanity. They said, I do not listen. So listen, I shall not to the judge who fights for no one unless it regards his lot. They said, I do not see, and therefore I shall not even try to understand the apology for getting caught. I will only ever listen to the child crying out, desperate for sweet freedom from the chains of a mind cult. I will only ever see doors that can be opened for my brother to walk through and claim the treasures laid up for him. I will only ever understand the purpose of my fight for my sister who is priceless and worth her throne in the sunlight. I see freedom and ability. I hear yes and amen. My seeds of hope will produce a harvest. This I believe, this I understand. And so friends, we are thankful for the words from Anna Jane Lange. We now turn to our panelists who will be presenting for 10 minutes each and I now call upon the EDR team, Rise to Life, Context, Illusions and Oxymorons. Why, why do we celebrate the recovery of health but fear death. We celebrate the sustaining of and the returning and rising to life, but fear death as if it is not part of life. What does life look like through the lens of death? What does life and death look like through the lenses of disabled bodies? What does the theme rise to life say about us? These are critical questions, and they will be answered differently depending on one's context, culture, and tradition, and depending on one's lenses and values, biases, and illusions. In this presentation, PG and Sai will help us see these differences by offering readings of John 11, the story which claims and celebrates that Jesus raised Lazarus from death to life. First, from their own experiences and contexts in the Philippines and Fiji, and then from oxymoronic points of illusions and biases. If the story of John 11 happened in my country, the Philippines, Jesus would have arrived during Lazarus' wake as the burial will only happen between seven to ninth day after his death. Jesus would have seen family and friends, including some from overseas, reunited and gathered together to honor Lazarus. 
Filipinos view death as one of the most important occasions in family life. For many, the death of a relative is an opportunity to strengthen family ties and a cause for reunion. Morning rituals are observed to demonstrate kinship and communal healing at the most difficult time. Jesus would have joined a pasham, a predominantly Filipino Catholic mourning tradition where those left behind will hold a novena in the house of the bereaved for nine straight days after the person's death. The Philippine National Center for Cultures and the Art notes that pasham is tied to the belief that it is only on the ninth day after the person has died when the soul departs from the worldly realm onto the afterlife. Pasham will be followed by Cuarenta Dias, which takes place on the 40th day of the person's death. A mass and a gathering party is held at the cemetery by family and friends to commemorate the belief that the dead roam around the earth for 40 days before living. This is a Filipino parallel to Christ's ascension. If the story happened in the Philippines, Jesus would not have been left late for the gathering of family and friends to farewell their departed loved one, Lazarus. In April 2020, I lost my best friend, my grandfather. He was an avid diver, a believer of the word, and a fighter for the marginalized in society. He was also a missionary who contracted malaria in the mission field and a victim of diabetes. It was on his last mission trip to a prison in Papua New Guinea where he hurt his foot. This cut was the beginning of his demise. And as a result, he needed to have his toe and later his leg amputated. His body became disabled as he was left limited in his movement. This was an incredibly difficult time for us as a family, as we knew his heart was in the mission field and he would often walk and swim miles to share the word of God. Now moving to John 11, if I was to place myself in Martha and Mary's position, I do not know if I would want to see my grandfather rise to life. In saying that, please do not confuse it with my wish to see him again, as that is something I wish for every day. However, there is something about rising to life and allowing a diseased and disabled body to become able that really troubles me. Why do we assume that resurrection from resting in peace is good? Have we ever considered what it would be like for those who have died and for their loved ones? If we were to bring this into the context of 2021, a world post but truly mid pandemic, how do we explain consent and the uncovering of bodies that are not only no longer abled, but that have been dead for four days? We tend to imagine that Lazarus was an abled-bodied person. Could he have been disabled? If so, did this have anything to do with Jesus taking his time to come meet the family? In the context of COVID-19, my people are still allowed to mourn, but not on their own terms. To prevent the spread of the virus, Domestic regulations in the Philippines call for expeditious terminations of confirmed or suspected COVID-19 victims within 12 hours post-mortem. Bodies are rushed directly from hospitals to crematoria, barring families from seeing their loved ones before they are buried. Mass gathering is also forbidden. The different guidelines in dealing with dead bodies during this pandemic prohibit family members to come closer to express their emotions of gratitude and to say sorry as they pay their last respect to their dead. His COVID practices bring trauma, anger, and also guilt to the families. Lazarus rising to life interrupts several routines. 
it interrupts Lazarus from resting in peace, and it interrupts Mary, Martha, and the collective from mourning and healing properly. I would imagine that Jesus, raising Lazarus from the dead, will pose problems to the dead business, specifically to cremation. Much like in the text, there will be some groups who will not be happy with Jesus raising people from the dead. There are reports that some private crematoriums are taking advantage of the situation, overcharging costs by several thousand pesos compared during ordinary times, making the cost of cremation three times more than the monthly allowance needed by one person to survive in the Philippines. Clearly, there are people making living out of the dead. In the first few verses of John 11, Jesus learns that Lazarus is sick and responds that his sickness will not end in death. However, after saying that, Jesus stays where he is for two more days and then chooses to journey back to Judea after knowing that Lazarus has died. The Bible does not say why Jesus stayed two days longer, that is open to interpretation. He may have been healing the sick and performing miracles, or he may have been praying and resting. It is possible that he was in Jordan, for that is where he was in the last verses of John 10. Nevertheless, there is a slight disconnect between when Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick and him traveling to raise him from the dead. It is possible that Jesus knew Lazarus would die before he visited and that he waited for his death to show people that he is the Messiah. Why do we mourn death but celebrate life and resurrection when surely to be resurrected means to eventually die again? If we are to consider all those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic, to COVID-19, to old age, freak accidents, and by other means, although we mourn their loss and the inability to grieve in unison, would we want them to be resurrected? How would, oh, what would the resurrection of a disabled body mean to you? How does rise to life relate to us in this context? As we consider this text and the resurrection of Lazarus after four days, let us consider how we would respond if that were our brother, son, father, grandfather. Would we rejoice in their rising of life? Or would we also ask, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept them from dying? Thank you very much, Sai, Pichi, and Sioni there. So Graham is going to speak to us on glimpses of God's disabled domain, rising up against empire in small steps and huge leaps. Over to you, Graham. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Cedar Rem for this uh, opportunity to explore an angle on the system, which is a little bit new to me theologically but familiar biographically. Can we hear me, can you hear me so far, team? Because we've got uh, technical problems here. And so um, I hope that, um, I'm, I'm gonna have to be asking people um, using the PowerPoint to, to change the slides for me as I don't have control of things. So thanks. You have the first slide when you're ready. Great. So I begin with a brief outline of some context, experiences which inform and shape my explorations, which are effectively about reconceiving what we mean by normal, picking up on the now familiar notion of a new normal and who gets to decide what norm normality is. Thanks. So how should I describe my mother? 
what's interesting to me is that in the written draft of this paper so far, I've named her disability first before outlining her many abilities. But here on the screen, I've reversed it, highlighting her many abilities first while explaining that she had a disability which affected her and which affected life for us as a family in many ways. And that ambiguity between abilities and dis disabilities and which defines the person is why I use the term with a slash within it, dis slash abled, because it was always clear to me that the dis didn't capture the whole person. Thanks. In my father's later years, he developed dementia and mum became his carer, reversing the situation from before. Dementia affected his identity so that on the one hand, he was not fully the person who he was. And yet at the same time, there were glimpses of him even more intensely than before. And then there's also a little boy in my life with a rare condition called Jubert syndrome, which affects his brain development. It's called developmental delay because there's a presumed pace at which things should happen. He has many difficulties, but also gives a huge amount of joy. So just the first few bits of context. Do the next line as well, thanks. So as we begin to interpret those glimpses of our context and describe the wider world which shapes our experience of those realities, one of the most essential elements is that it is a world which measures by deficit, what the people cannot do, because it is the deficits which determine what sort of support they need to function in the world as it is. It can be demoralizing and dehumanizing to define a loved one by their deficits, because it is untrue. Thanks. It is untrue because it objectifies the person, turns them into a measurement, an object. So one alternative is to focus on the assets, which is much more positive, but this can actually be exhausting, trying always to see the positive. And it also has an element of untruth about it as well. Why? Because to focus on the assets rather than the deficits is still to dance to the tune of measurement. The truth of the person remains quantifiable according to the economy of truth. There is another way to consider and look for the whole person as storied truthfulness, a person who continues to be and to become, both as living memories and the unfolding story of their lives. This is, if you like, the ecology of truth, concerned with the unfolding connections, impact, and relationships. To make this turn towards the storied truthfulness of a whole life is to begin by naming the colonization of our mindsets and social structures, the Western bias towards measurement, which conditions how we glimpse one another, but especially how we glimpse those whose deficits seem paramount. By naming it, by naming all of this mindset and seeking out something more holistic, we learn how to decolonize. The point though is not to romanticize the whole as though the whole truth is all beautiful because the pain and struggle of disability and its network of impacts and fights and disappointments, the demanding nature of many days is all part of the mix. But the point is to know that we don't see, we don't yet see the whole, we glimpse. And that can be enough to know that this is not the whole. And anyway, how do we, how should we decide what is a small step, a small change, a measurable change in a situation? What's striking with the young boy is that he helps you to notice the tiniest change, like the moment he began to contribute independently to a conversation, something you wouldn't normally think to measure. So is it a tiny step or is it a huge leap? It depends how you look at it. But on the other hand, should we talk about him missing or meeting milestones, markers in development along the way? Or is every inch stone worthy of recognition? Size is confusing and relational. It depends on the context. So maybe a bit of chaos theory can help, where a tiny event 
can cause a disproportionate effect, like a butterfly in one part of the world fluttering its wings and a hurricane emerging somewhere else. Maybe that's what happens in us, in our relationships. Tiny steps open up whole new worlds. When we see disability through the eyes of the shit stem, a system which dehumanizes with its bias towards measurement, supposedly objective measurement, we miss the truth of so many things. Whereas if we learn to glimpse differently, to see differently, we see worlds open up before us, but without romanticizing the struggle. In Mark chapter eight, a man who is blind is healed by Jesus. But is that what it's truly about? Or is it about how, during that process, he helps us as able-bodied people, those of us who are able-bodied, to see ourselves as seen, as glimpsed, and to be seen differently? To heal him, Jesus leads him out of the village, so out of his usual matrix, in which he will have been measured and objectified by others, seen in terms of deficit, what he lacked. Frustratingly, Jesus doesn't ask him if he wants to be healed, as he does in other moments. But after the first dose of saliva on his eyes, Jesus does ask him a question. So at that point, affirming his agency. Can you see anything? And he can. He sees people, but they look like trees walking. This raises so many questions, but at the heart of it, I'm interested in this powerful metaphor. Firstly, the able-bodied people get to see themselves as seen as glimpsed, in a sense objectified, not seen as human, but as something else. But wow, what a thing to be seen as, walking trees. But is it true? That we are seen in this way, we who think we can see, opens up the potential of solidarity amongst us and those whom we see or glimpse only partially we could demonstrate deeper solidarity on the basis of this potential chaos event, a small glimpse with potentially large implications. And to be seen as trees, wonderful life-giving trees, trees that give air to breathe and sanctuary to wildlife, and trees on the move, alive to dynamic world. This is the real ecology of truth, about our connections, our connectedness with life in all its fullness. All too often, we are mere humans, not so life-giving, but the unblind man opens up the possibility of a deeper vision for us to follow. And Jesus then urges him to go home another way. Things are different now. They can never be the same. New roads have opened up before him and before us. So how will we respond? The power of small steps, small glimpses, seemingly small moments in life, it is all glimpsed with new insight and potential. Whereas on the other hand, the apparent scale and grandness and power of the shit stem is relativized, diminished, put in its place, at least briefly. The colonial matrix, which conditions how we see each other, it is seen through for all its limitations and its untruthfulness, and an alternative vision comes into focus. The power of a disabled child or an unblind man, the smallest of steps or glimpses or moments, it enables us to glimpse God's disabled domain, a new realm of possibility and deeper relationship and justice. Where the shit stem is disrupted as we defy the old habits of conditioning and we dare to build solidarity amongst all of us who know what it's like to be glimpsed and measured only partially, we open up the possibility of a world attentive to each other's storied truthfulness. Imagine what next. Can you glimpse it? Thank you. And thank you, tech team. Thank you very much, Graham. I mean, that's a good um, question to leave us on. Imagine what next. Imagine the possibilities. We are going to have an art presentation by Neil Thorogood. Uh, there must, and it's titled, the piece is titled, There Must Be a God Somewhere. And after Neil's reflection, 
I would then invite um, the first set of response from Beverly, who is listening to both of the present, all three of the presentations. So Neil, can you um, proceed with your piece for us? Oh, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. So here's the picture. And um, I'm offering you a visual meditation, I guess, on a bit of context, but also on a bit of my story, a bit of the context story in which I now find myself. I think it's a, a picture that is in all sorts of ways trying to dig into what does it mean to rise to life and what does it mean to deal in death and what does it mean to discover something more. It's a confession, um, it's a lament, it is a nightmare, um, but I think it might also be, at least for me, an invitation to journey and to combat some of those things that destroy life, some of the things that the system and our histories have cursed us with. Uh, the context for this piece is that in 2020, in the summer of 2020, my wife and I moved into uh, a new ministry in Bristol in the United Kingdom where I serve two United Reformed churches. And uh, it was a context I know very little about. I had never visited Bristol other than in the process of seeking out this call to ministry. And I think dimly, I confess dimly, I was aware that Bristol played a major part in the transatlantic slave trade. But my journey and the journey of this picture took a different turn on Sunday, the 7th of June, 2020, which was about a month before we moved, when there was a Black Lives Matter protest in Bristol. And as part of that, the statue of Edward Colston was torn down and then dragged through the center of Bristol to the docks. And then it was thrown into the harbor where the slave ships used to be tied up. And I guess in this image, what I'm trying to do is hold together something of that day, but also what that day and, and what that has meant as I have then come to live into this place uh, and to fall in love with this place and its people and its communities. And that's part of the gift for me, but also to then discover what it means to delve into the real difficult, difficult story of what makes Bristol the place it is. And so my, my picture is structured around an inside and an outside, and there is a barred window. And there is darkness and there is light, there is, there is stuff happening and there is a stillness. And I suppose I'm trying to play with what does it mean to be maybe almost simultaneously held captive by some things and liberated by other things. What does it mean to be free? And what does it mean to be chained? And where might God be in all of that? The painting is of actually the plinth that Edward Colston's statue used to stand upon. I've stood in front of it many times since we moved to Bristol and uh, you can see uh, you would have to be able to zoom in to see all the detail. Maybe that'll come when, we, when we're able to put this into the book of these uh, seminars. Uh, on the plinth, there is, a, there is a, a, a plaque, and the plaque says this, erected by citizens of Bristol as a memorial of one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city, AD 1895. And... Um, Edward Colston's name has been used to name streets and schools and concert halls in Bristol. And part of what is happening right now is that his name is being erased, his name is being removed, those places are being renamed. And so part of my being in the prison or out of the prison, I guess, is wondering what happens when, when we do tear down and try to dismantle some of the awful things, some of the nightmares of our stories and our histories, 
in a place like Bristol. But what is the risk if in fact we erase some of that history and no longer teach it, no longer agonize with it, no longer wrestle with it, no longer learn from it? If Colston's name disappears entirely from this place, then some of what I'm reflecting on might be harder to reflect upon. He was a leading merchant of his day. He belonged to London's Royal African Company, which uh, was at the heart of the creation of the transatlantic slave trade and held the monopoly on trading slaves uh, until Bristol and Liverpool began to take over. And if you look to the right hand side of my image, I've collaged some numbers and some names. Between 1698 and 1807, over 2000 slave voyages were financed and set out from Bristol. And they carried something like half a million slaves, which is something like one sixth of the slaves transported during the transatlantic slave trade. Bristol was no stranger to dealing in slaves, it turns out. In the 11th century, Irish and English slaves were traded through the port of Bristol. So this is a history and a story that runs very deep. It means that on average for over 109 years, something like 18 different slave voyages set out from this place. Colston was a, a key operator in that trade. And underneath my big numbers, you'll see columns and those columns are names. And those are some of the names I'm beginning to get to know and to encounter, thanks to some of the work that many others have done to uncover the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade here in Bristol. So there are the names there. Colston's name is actually one of those names, but there are many, many others, actually something like 194 names of people who uh, were involved in owning the ships or who captained the ships or who actually owned slaves on plantations. Uh, many of them receiving huge amounts of money um, when they uh, had to give up that as part of the ending of the slave trade. But also included in my list, there are some other names. There are not so many of them. And that's part of the agony, I guess. Names of those who are abolitionists, names of Quakers and others who early on said this this thing that we are doing and that we are building the world upon, this thing that makes the wheels of the economy churn, this thing that is generating so much money to build beautiful houses and squares and buildings and schools in Bristol, this thing is abhorrent and evil. People like Hannah Moore, an evangelical writer, People like Josiah Tucker, the Anglican Dean of Bristol, and people like Anne Yearsley, who was a local poet. But to finish my reflection, you'll see that there is someone standing on the plinth. And that someone is Jen Reed. On the day that Colston's statue was torn down, a black woman in Bristol named Jen Reed climbed onto the plinth and her photo uh, went viral and so I've included lots of people taking photos of her on their mobile phones but another another bit of my wondering is to what extent does our interconnectedness on our mobile phones set us free and to what extent does it also hold us in some ways captive but Jen Reed stood and she says this seeing the statue of Edward Colston being thrown into the river felt like a truly historical moment, huge. When I was stood there on the plinth and raised my arm in a black power salute, it was totally spontaneous. I didn't even think about it. It was like an electrical charge of power was running through me. My immediate thoughts were for the enslaved people who died at the hands of Colston and give them power. I wanted to give George Floyd power. 
I wanted to give power to black people like me who have suffered injustice and inequality, a surge of power out to them all. And there's a final element to my picture. There's a, there's a little placard propped against the plinth and on that placard are the words of Desmond Tutu. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And that quote and the pictures that he saw encouraged Mark Quinn, who is a British artist and sculptor, to get in touch with Jen Reed and to, with her permission, create a statue of her standing on the plinth. And one night, that statue was erected and for a few days before Bristol City Council removed it, it stood on the plinth. The plinth is now empty. And I guess as I think of rising to life in this new place, and I think of the wonders of it, the goodness of it, the kindness of the people, I also wonder what does it mean that there is in the heart of our city an empty plinth where once upon a time a slave trader stood and then for a short time Jen Reed stood. Thank you. Thank you very much Neil. Lots of powerful words and imageries and um, metaphors from your presentation. Confession, lament, nightmare, erasure, um, much more. Friends and colleagues, it has been a long day for us. I think we need to draw this to an end now because we can go on with this conversation and we have two more days to do it. So let not your hearts be troubled. Just believe that we're going to do it. So we thank the presenters for their input and we give thanks to you, the audience, for joining us today. And we look forward to your joining us, um, not tomorrow, but the next day after tomorrow. So our webinars would continue on the 27th and on the 29th of October. And on both days, we will have three sessions. And so six sessions more remaining as shown on the screen now. I think my colleagues would ought to show it on the, the screen now at this point in time. There are recordings of the, this, this session and previous sessions will be made available later in a couple of weeks time on the eDare microsite. So kindly be aware of this. And uh, your feedback to us is also very important. So we'd like to ask you to kindly answer um, the evaluation questions that will be posted on your screen at the end of the, the session. So thank you presenters. Thank you colleagues. Those of you who have journeyed not only in this session, but during this day and wherever you are, Stay well, be well, be blessed, and go well. We are indeed grateful for your, this opportunity to engage collectively. Thank you. <laughs>